dementia researcher with a blog and a rating. A formality for those working towards a master's or PhD and conducting qualitative research is to acknowledge and articulate their subjectivity and reflexivity. In this post, I try to get my head around these two complex sounding and entangled concepts and hopefully provide some insight for others who, like me, are constructing positionality and reflexivity statements. These terms may seem a little vague or soft for those less familiar with the dark arts of qualitative research, but by considering the research social, historical and applied context, for example issues such as power, equity and political agenda, and also your social position in the research, positionality, and the impact or utility of this on the research processes, reflexivity, is widely accepted as a way of enhancing rigour in qualitative, quantitative and mixed methods research. Granted, it is uncommon for quantitative and mixed method studies to claim intersubjectivity between the research and the researcher, and to do so would contradict traditionalist views that the world should be understood in an unbiased, objective, systematic and controlled way. However, I would argue, along with many others, not only qualitative researchers, that very little, if any, social research can be value-free. So what is positionality? Despite being ever-present in researchers and research, theoretically, positionality sounds a bit vague, and in practice it can similarly lack visibility, unless properly understood and considered. The term is used by researchers to describe both their view of the world and social positions in relation to the research and its context. I know, even with this textbook description, it still is lacking clarity as a concept. To understand our worldview, innate beliefs and assumptions may be considered through ontological, epistemological and axiological dimensions. At another level, we can consider how these beliefs and assumptions intersect with and are shaped by broader social, cultural and political factors, such as social class, religion, political ideology, gender, health. As a researcher, I hold a position of both power and disadvantage, whether that be in the context of class, ethnicity, health or education. To ignore these would mean risking the research, reproducing or exacerbating systemic societal inequalities. To further reduce the process, we can think about how we locate positionality in the context of our research project and processes. There are three recognised areas to consider. One, the subject under investigation. Two, the research participants. And lastly, the research process. For example, the primary populations of interest in my research are people living with dementia and family carers. Therefore, I can be considered an insider because I am a family carer for a person living with dementia. I am somebody who is studying a population and culture similar to their own and therefore understand and can associate with the challenges of this community face. It is important I continue to acknowledge the opportunities and limitations of this through a reflexive approach. It is challenging to disentangle our background to understand how such leads to certain values, assumptions and theories taking shape and place in research. Yet when such understanding is achieved, it can be actively and strategically drawn on, used reflexively in the research as though it were an ethnographic toolkit. So what does reflexivity mean? Well, it's closely connected to positionality. Reflexivity is similarly considered an integral part of qualitative research. It can be hard to disentangle these very well-connected, if not coexisting, concepts, but handling them well and do so with simplicity. They say, if positionality refers to what we know and believe, then reflexivity is about what we do with this knowledge. Reflexivity is about being sensitive to your positionality, personal and professional, in recognition that these influence the research process and, by extension, the research outcomes. For example, By the very nature of doing social research, aspects of your personal values and academic prestige will naturally influence the research. For example, if you're an unpaid family carer, then you may take a social justice perspective and frame it as work, ensuring that unpaid labour is accounted for as a cost in economic evaluations. It's important to engage with and clearly articulate reflexivity, because it provides opportunities to improve the trustworthiness of the research, by making the assumptions, choices, beliefs and positions taken in the research process more transparent. A key consideration when planning and writing a positionality and or reflexivity statement 
is that in many cases, our view of the world and social positions are neither static or controllable. And political views, professional occupations, personal experiences and so on are time and context dependent. Therefore, in many research projects, it is important to take a reflexive approach. For example, in my research, I have chosen to maintain a consistent approach across both qualitative and quantitative phases of the mixed method study and will be considering my place in the research iteratively and recursively. Where appropriate, these will be woven into my written work. I hope this post helps pinpoint some of the key tenets and differences of positionality and reflexivity and support their application in research. I seem to learn more about this area each time I return to it, and so you may find a number of resources listed below helpful and interesting. Ta. Thank you for listening. Join the Dementia Research bloggers and share your own views.